real story. So you just mentioned children, and that is very important uh, part of our discussion today. We have people who remove their masks, for example, because they are not ready to dump it yet. Mm. They've started the day, and they haven't finished with the day, so they are not ready to dump it. Or they are using mask that is reusable. Mm. So they pull it off and hang it around the table or a chair or in the car, and they hang it around maybe the gear or something like that. How dangerous is that? Yeah, it's very, and that's why I say we should also look at our circumstances. For if you have a home that has little children, under five, even under 10 years, mm. these are kids whose cognitive function are not really up to the level where. So you may have to take extra precautions. Because you see, the thing about COVID that I also want to put on record is that even the science of the COVID spread and is still evolving. So I even tell people that the precautions should be double. Because tomorrow the scientific community comes to say this, tomorrow is that. Mm -hmm. So if we have children, then we need to take the extra precaution, even if it means that we are putting somewhere in a locked place where the kids are out of reach of the children. But not to, let's say, you put on a bed where the child comes down on top of you. Daddy, you come from work. Mm -hmm. And then he touches that. Sometimes even not with that knowledge. Right. But kids sometimes they think they are asleep, they are awake. Mm -hmm. They come when you are asleep, maybe you put the nose mask on and asleep. Mm. <laughs> he sees that face mask as a toy. Right. Thinking it's one of those little toys mm. that you press around mm. and maybe even start licking the nose mask. Okay. So please, I think we are appealing to the Ghanaian public that look at your circumstances, especially right. if you have children, mm. go the extra mile mm. and let's take extra precautions. Great. So you were about to talk about, um, um, Sanam, you were about to talk about the transportation or the conveyance of yes. the waste. Um, if you, we remove it from generating them in our homes, our offices and hospitals and so on, they must be conveyed from one point to the other. How can it be done in a manner that protects us? Protect us. Thank you very much, Dr. Samson. Yes, so when we come to the waste transportation, when we're talking, we, we, we talked about the waste segregation. Mm. Now, in waste segregation, you separate the waste into different color coded liners. Mm. Okay, so with our color codes, black is for general waste, then yellow is for infectious okay. waste. Okay, so at the storage, that, at the external storage, your, bin, your bigger bin that you have outside, one bin will be allocated for general waste, one bin will be allocated for, general, uh, for medical waste or the infectious waste. So all the yellow bags will go into the infectious waste bin. Mm. then all the black bags will go into the general waste bin. There will be two separate transportation systems. One truck, which can be a compaction truck, who will come around to pick up just the general waste. Then a specialized vehicle, which is for the infectious waste. Now I say specialized because the specification of the truck must be, one, airtight. It should be a leak-proof vehicle. It should be of a form of a cargo-like nature. And if you want an ideal nature, the, wa the, waste, uh, the truck should have a cooling system. The cooling system will, will freeze the waste at a, a temperature of about 4 degrees Celsius. What happens is that at this temperature, the microorganisms are not able to proliferate. Mm. So do not be multiplying, which may result in odor, emission, and stuff. If, if it's a healthcare facility, for example, the pathological waste, which is the tissues, uh, organs, and stuff, it helps to reduce the decomposition rate during transportation. So this is the ideal way that we need to operate. So that, that infectious waste vehicle will come at a separate time scheduled to come and pick up all the waste. The waste, the, those that will be handling the waste should be in the appropriate PPEs. Mm. So that they themselves will be safe because you are picking waste that is potentially infectious. So you need to protect yourself for. Do we have an idea the number of waste collectors in our co community who are not formalized, like Zoom Lion does, mm. yeah. who are part of the chain mm. in the transportation of the waste. Do we have an idea? Y yes, please. Yeah. What percentage yes. of the waste is scattered by them yeah. as compared to what uh, Zoom Lion does? Yes. yes. Uh, it's a, there's an interesting scenario that is actually happening. 
Now, I hope most of you have, have heard of this baller taxis exactly. and tricycle operators. Right. Actually, they, they form the informal sector. Mm -hmm. Okay. And from records, there are about 3,000 operating in the system because they have some associations that they formed. Right. Now, this informal sector currently is picking about 40% of the waste. They are able to go to the slums. They're able to go to areas that our trucks they are dealing with about 40 percent of the waste of it, yes because and you see them often yes you don't see them even with hand gloves nothing and if they have some they will not treat when they use them they come into your home they pick the bin they just dump it and you see them use their bare hands bare hand. try to compact the waste yes. what do you say about that yes so this is actually giving us the picture of uh, the risks that we're actually um, facing. These people are potential transport uh, or transporters of this, in quote, coronavirus, because they go from home to home. Mm -hmm. They might go to a positive home, take the waste, then put it on a being that is, in quote, um, negative, <laughs> okay, in quote, negative, because as we know, the virus has the potential of taking on, on the hands because of the lipids interaction between the virus and our pumps, mm. creating the covalent bond. So when it touches another surface, it's able to transfer to that surface. So the owner of the house just comes to pick up the, the bean into his home. In case the person doesn't wash your hand, it implies that he's also, also going to spread it on door handles and extra, mm -hmm. um, presenting risks to the other occupants of the home. So this question has really drawn attention to the fact that something needs to be done about this informal sector. Okay, so now hold on and gather your thoughts more clearly on how this group that is taking care of about 40% of the waste and they are not formalized like Zoom Lion is and other waste management companies are, um, what advice they can get so that they protect themselves first and protect all of us, uh, they come to our homes. How will they do that? Now, let me bring in Franklin. Now, uh, Franklin, as you hear um, Senam and Dr. Dami on the questioning of the waste that is generated in our homes, particularly the PPEs, and in offices, and in the hospitals, and how this is disposed of, what comes to your mind? Well, um that's quite sobering um, to think that we haven't, uh, first of all, not only do a lot of people understand the what we are dealing with in terms of environmental education, um, it's one of the challenges we have. But on top of that is the, is the, is the tacit, if you like, um, approval of the state of things by our state actors. And why do I say this? Um, yes, maybe the NCC and a number of other civic actors may be educating people about cleanliness, uh, but it also takes a lot of um, financial muscle to be able to, as it were, manage this waste properly. So I can understand the challenge with how people are treating waste, indeed treating environmental uh, situations from their homes. Uh, that is that that part of the education must be done. But the other part that is significantly missing is the way these waste eventually get disposed. So you can understand that from the home there may be challenges, but there's a much bigger challenge when we eventually have to dispose this waste, however unsegregated the waste really are. So that gives that takes us to what the current situation really looks like and why we think that the MMD is who have been empowered, who have been part of the, the, the if you like, the uh, public service duty in order to manage waste. Uh, unfortunately, just see them as public service mm. and, and an unrewarded one. So to the extent that the fees, the levies that are supposed to be paid in the safe disposal of waste itself is called into question. So we have miserly, you know, uh, fees that are paid. And when miserly fees are paid, what it translates into is that it leads to um, a, 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 some sort of deficit attention given to the infrastructure that should lead to the waste safe disposal of waste. So I'm talking landfills, I'm talking even roads leading to landfills, which That's are right. not properly 
constructed. As we speak, I think I'm told that about three or so landfills in the country, if not within Accra, are, are not op uh, in operation. Mm. And the roads leading to them themselves are decrepit. Now, on top of that, some of the compactor trucks that have to safely dispose of this waste um, are, are not in, we, don't, we do not have them in sufficient numbers. And even when we've had them in numbers that private actors like Zoom Lion may have invested in, they do not get their returns in record time, if ever at all, because of the absence of fiscal incentives. You know, what we are dealing with is a hydra-headed problem, and I'm just speaking to the public policy aspect of it. All right. And to think that there are about nine various levies and fees that um, waste management companies have to pay in order to import compactor trucks and, on, uh, and, and cumulatively comes to about 22% in terms of taxes. Um, when you compare that with their profit margin of just about 20%, which gets eaten away by all these levies anyway. What it means is that they are left with just a 2.5%, if you like, rigor room in order to do anything significantly. That is, includes investing in R&D uh, and then investing in you know, uh, operations that will scale up their, their activities. So you have a situation where on top of the individual disinterest in managing waste or treating waste properly, uh, you have a public, you know, vehicle which does not seem to prioritize um, interventions and in, in waste in the in the same dis disposal delivery of waste. Mm -hmm. I would have thought that by now, uh, this country would be interested in asking private actors to invest in setting up, you know, biomedical waste disposal uh, uh, equipment. Uh, sorry, uh, facility throughout the country. As the engineer has rightly said, there's only one in Accra, and it's serving close to 500 hospitals. And just about 200 hospitals use this facility. So it tells you that in this corona times, what it means is that the increased activity, the increased waste that we see, uh, would definitely not be treated by these entities. Mm. But, so if these entities were mandated to use this, the autoclave, um, I mean, this facility, what it means is that we'll be minimizing the the the, the unintended consequences of a uh, right. of a truck okay. with another. Um, yes, uh, and, and Franklin, you you bring you bring on, you know, an aspect that also is quite scary, and you see, as he spoke about these um, uh, collectors who use tricycles and others, and as we are told by Senam they are dealing with about 40% of the waste from our homes, our offices, and so on and so forth. Franklin spoke about the conveyance process. As they take them, you see them, drive them, and these are in the open. Their vehicles or their tricycles are open. You see flies all over them. And they drive them through our homes, main streets, markets, before they take them to the final destination. Dr. Dami, what would you say about that? Yeah, so, um, something, I think that's why I was trying to spend some time to talk to you about the policy architecture about that, that, that happened. Because I think we did a recce, and clearly we realized that these were gaps that we had in the system, like in engineering those. Medical waste was not something we had really categorized very clearly. And it wasn't an area we had gone into very rapidly. But as the evidence started coming up, so actually in 2015, as a ministry, we started a project with UNDP. We've been doing major trainings for uh, engineers, send them as a part of. But clearly, one of the things we said that the ministry starts with both public and private, all actors, and including civil society. So based on that, we develop what we call the healthcare waste management policy and develop clear guidelines. And based on that, for me, in the policy realm, the policy doesn't end with the document. It ends with implementation. Mm -hmm. So it didn't end there. And like I said, I know we've had a couple of trainings with them. As I'm even speaking to you now, there are trainings happening for hotel staff yeah. on how they handle medical waste and how they categorize them. Hands on. And then... Yeah, but but got, here we are talking about the reality, yes, where they are coming into our homes. They are not telling anybody that 
you know, because of coronavirus, separate your waste. And when we come, let us have the mask and other things you use because of coronavirus separate because these are highly infectious. And then we put them in our general dustbins. They pick them up. They dump them. They use their hands, their legs. You hear them. You see them stepping on them. And they are driving these away in a manner that potentially exposes everybody on the way to the dump site. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm coming to. And that's why these trainings have become very handy. Because like I say, most of these are informal sector people are like, look, let me also cut some weight. So he gets some tricycle, he also starts picking some things in. Well, you and me know the informal community we have in this country. But like I always say, you don't push them out of business, you train them to see how they will still be able to put something on the table. And that's why in the training we are taking cognizance of the informal actors. And like he said, I know the work that has been going on. Trying to work in hand in hand with the informal actors. Actually, there's even a conversation before we enter the room. I was talking to Senam. Where Zoom Live is even going to try to partner with some of these informal actors. So they cut the waste to their level and then they pick it up from there. And now we end up training them into categorization, a bit of the medical waste, a bit of what should happen. I can give you practical examples of what's happening in some facilities now. Mm -hmm. Like you go to Ga East now, there's a separate waste bin for uh, yellow. Yeah, you mentioned informer, that. Mm -hmm. informer, all the hazardous infectious waste goes there. They even have on site autoclave right there. So they are able to take it through the autoclaving process. What we've realized said or rather is that some of our people have some of the old incinerators. But unfortunately, since the Stockholm Declaration in 2001, which came into effect in 2004 on persistent organic pollutants, those incinerators are unable to combust at beyond 800 degrees Celsius. And they have some of them have very low chimneys. They end up releasing a lot of persistent organic pollutants into the atmosphere. And that's where the other issues come in. The whole issues around a lot of issues about cancers, mm -hmm. health yeah, conditions, yeah. lung conditions, big issues around climate change, all kinds. So we are trying to discourage the use of those old incinerators. Mm -hmm. Zoom Park has a very modern, I think it's even a hydrocleave. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, like a hydrocleave yeah. addition, which is able to combust at those right temperatures and based on that remote. So a lot of action has happened now, but I want to agree with you fully that these are still early stages. And then we need to ramp up beyond that crowd mm. a bit more rapidly. As a doctor, yeah. my question is, what's the risk mm. in this process of collecting and disposing of the waste? And we have not even talked about where they go and dump them mm. and what happens after they have been dumped at that place. And remember, we're talking about good environmental governance and the coronavirus pandemic. Mm. So it's not just about picking the waste and go dump them anywhere and we are okay with it. Yeah, so it's, it's wrong. I mean, basically, but I also, I'm also real practical to the fact that some of this point in the business, they don't even know about all these health effects they are just picking. And it's actually, if you actually move out of Accra, even in Accra, some part of Accra, you have all these informal actors, some of them don't even have any company, no name, who pick this, as even, even as they move it forth along the streets. Yeah. So this is why we'll call on the local government because, you see, the good thing is that we have the laws to put a bit of these regulations in place. The Public Health Act is clear of 2012 at 851. That's why the Section 5 is all devoted towards environmental sanitation. So this is where the local government service and also actually the environmental health officer has been mandated to move into homes to sometimes even accost all these individuals and subject to some penalty and take them through training and all that. So we really want okay. to call that a bulk of the work mm. in this area goes beyond the health sector. Mm. The cost of our local government service, please, let's go back. We have appropriate laws in this country right. to make progress. Right. So uh, Dr. Dami is talking about the laws. Yeah. On this matter, I'm very reluctant to be quick about the law and cracking the whip on this informal group that is cutting as much as 40% of the waste in our homes and offices and in our community um, because we know that you, the formal institutions, the biggest one like Zoom Lion, you don't have the capacity to take all our waste from our homes. And that's why they are important. Mm. Some waste can sit in our homes for as long as forever until these people come in, 
you know, and provide the needed intervention. The question I asked you earlier, and you had to hold on for us to return to you, was what advice can we give to minimize the risk that this manner of waste collection poses first to the collectors themselves, the homes and places where they collect this waste, mm -hmm. and the process of conveying the waste to the dump sites. Thank you very much, Mr. Samson. Yeah, so um, with regards to the first question you asked, now um, there's this association, ESPA, Environmental Sanitation Providers Association. Yes, they're actually trying to regularize this informal sector people. So they are registering them, getting their details, and they organize periodic training for these people. But you know that with this situation, it's, it's both sides, the leader and then the person. It's, it's both responsibility to actually do what is right. So the leaders are doing their best mm. to actually get these people on board, to organize them, train them, for them to be aware of this. But their attitude is also another thing. You know, just to say, or pardon me to say that... This the, sort of training has been going on for how long now? Oh, to the best of my knowledge, for about two years now. About two years now? Yes, it has And started. they are still cutting the waste. They don't cover them. Yes. It's we see flies follow them yes. wherever At they go. Attitude, no and issue. And we see the waste. Sometimes there's some accident and everything falls on the road. Yes. And you see them literally use their bare hands to pick them back into their tricycles. Yes. Let, let me tell you an, 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 an interesting situation. You know, these people, when they go to dump, okay, they are charged per trip, okay? Right. So they try as much as possible to load their little tricycle with as much waste that they can so they can get a lot of money, then pay less at the end point. Mm. So that's what actually results in they falling down. You can see some of them toppling even upwards this way. Right. So they, they, you train someone, but the person's attitude to actually implement what you've trained is also another thing. And these people are not, in quotes, the educated ones. They are those that are actually trying to do their own things. So they actually, you talk to them and they... So what should we be to. doing? That's really what it is, the mm -hmm. solution. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. yeah. in, in, in the pandemic, coronavirus yes. pandemic yes. era, we need every solution and advice we can get because they expose all of us. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So actually what we can do is to rather provide strict enforcement of exactly. the laws. Strict. And the word is strict. If we catch you doing the wrong thing, you pay a penalty, like what the president has, has just done. If, if, if you are caught outside without the nose marks, you see how intensive the penalty is. Something like that should also be implemented. And I think when we get two or three people, as an example, the rest will be careful and know what is actually happening. And just to add, with respect to capacity, you know, Zoom Lion has the ability to even expand to cover up the whole of Ghana. Mm. But the market is open to all. Everyone needs to come in to have a share, provided you, are, you have the adequate capacity to do so. You know, we've taken the front line of even venturing into this medical waste management. We're the first first people to actually do that. And, and, and it's a high risk area, as, as uh, Mr. Franklin said. Return on investment is so slow. Mm. As at now, we've not even recovered one city. Okay, so Zoom Lion and others are doing this in a more formal way. Formal way yes. You have your workers who we see they are offering in overalls. Mm. Some of them have hand gloves that they use, yes. and you see them use all sorts of protective gear. Yes. So beyond Zoom Lion, how many other waste management entities do we have in the country that is taking care of the 60%? Uh, actually, I, I, I don't have the figures of head now, but mm. they, are, they are from the records that I saw recently, about 50 or so have registered mm. with the ESPA with regards to formal sector. Right. Operators, but their capacity is not enough. That's why you, you, you don't see them visibly mm -hmm. operating. Right. Yes, that's what We see the informal the ones informal. a lot more around our homes than we see yes. your vehicles. And the reason is that now they are making more money because of Mm. The areas that they're able to penetrate right. into. And you know, they don't have schedules and stuff. They right. just move anytime, anywhere mm. to mm. just pick up. And, okay. I, and, I, and I think they're also doing a good work in quotes right. with, with respect to the waste collection. Mm. 
And what we have also done is to, as a formal sector, to help is to provide waste transfer stations. Mm. That place is where the waste collectors bring their waste to dump. Mm. And then we rather take the waste in huge volumes to mm. the landfill site, okay. which is located. Right. Let me get to uh, Franklin now. And if you are just joining us, this is the National uh, Commission for Civic Education's National Dialogue. It's held uh, quarterly, and this is the fifth uh, virtual Arab National Dialogue on good environmental governance and the coronavirus pandemic. The NCC is basically seeking to assist you with education to know how to manage your waste, particularly related to, particularly related to the use of your PPEs and their children around the home and of course their children around, how you generate the waste, how you get the waste disposed of in a manner that does not put you at risk. So the hashtag is hashtag NCCE Dialogue on Joy. And this is supported by the European Union. We are coming to you live from the Joy News Channel and also on Joy 99.7 FM and all our social media platforms are activated. We uh, will take questions from you as well. So if you have any uh, questions, uh, send them through any of our platforms and we'll share them with our guests for some answers. Contributions will also uh, be taken. Now, uh, Franklin, once again, um, how can we begin to look at the solutions? And I'm looking at all of these waste generated and taken to the dump sites, the environmental impact on all of us. Well, thank you very much. I think technology, by and large, is something we should be looking at. But but technology, before we get to technology, and I suspect, as um, the good engineer has suggested, there are very few companies that have the capacity to, as it were, invest in the modern technology. Mm. So there's one part which means you have to invest in it. You need high, you need deep pockets to do that. Um, the challenge, as I've related not long ago, is that when you have now invested in these rather very, um, if you like, uh, capital-intensive enterprise, you need to have your rewards back. And rewards here are not necessarily because you want to appropriate the rewards and chop. It's to appropriate the rewards and extend and the skill so that you can take care of all the nook and cranny where there's, there's waste that has been generated. Nobody could fault this smaller abobo yes or whatever we call them, from getting to getting us uh, getting the waste from our homes, it's simply because, as uh, Dr. Dami said, the 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 policy architecture for the infrastructure, unfortunately, uh, is not coherent, and so you need bits and pieces of all of that. Look, uh, Amma, who happens to head the ESPA, Environmental Services uh, Providers Association, mm. has clearly that since 2014, there have been 22 waste management companies that have gone under. Now, to think that waste is a crucial matter, and these companies are investing out of about 40 or so, and if you have more than half of them go under, actually tells you how precarious the situation is. So you need to start looking at public-private partnerships that encourage this. But when you've done this, the law should not be failing you. Law from uh, uh, observing bylaws that ensure environmental cleanliness at individual and uh, if like corporate level, we should do that. But we must ultimately invest in the safe disposal of waste. And safe disposal does not necessarily mean throwing it away, but turning waste into proper organic, you know, materials. I would have thought that by now, the MMDs, um, some of them could come together, uh, agglomerate, and ensure that the some private partnership, public partnership projects uh, to erect facilities that would definitely lead to ensure that waste is safely disposed will be done. I do not think that most of the MMDAs have the capacity um, because they do not generate enough capital in the way, fees, uh, to, be, to go solo. But 
Definitely, private sector can do that. And uh, at the risk of sounding, you know, I'm quite capitalist of in thought. <laughs> I think that the state cannot do these things by itself. The state only appropriate. Look at how many times the president has said, oh, through my finance minister, I would ensure that incentives are given to private companies. It's never happened. Look at the number of times these have been, the promises have been made. But the state has been able to appropriate funds and when these funds are somehow, whatever, uh, uh, what's it called, allocated, you don't see the effect uh, on the ground. So mm. we need to ensure mm. that the, the structures that are in place, and the National Sanitation Ministry must get serious. This whole habit of setting up National Sanitation Authorities and setting up a panoply of, uh, what's it called, uh, actors, um, bureaucracies, is not the way to go. They should not be treating waste as if it's their domain, per se. Waste could also be managed intelligently by a combination of private partnerships. And I think that is where we need to go. Okay. 22 companies cannot die just like that. Oh. It doesn't speak well. It doesn't bode well for our cleanliness at all. And, and particularly, it thing, may appear that in this particular time, we ought to act with a sense of urgency and to mobilize as many of these formal institutions as we could to ensure that the risk is reduced. Now, I would need you to organize your thoughts as to the quick steps that must be taken immediately, immediately to assist, to ensure that uh, the role of public institutions, the EPA, the Ghana Health Service, sanitation officers, etc., in the nation's fight against the pandemic and the maintenance of good environmental governance practices is intact. The management and reduction of the effects of the production and disposal of PPEs and cleaning agents um, on the environment is also in such a way that it doesn't put us in further risks. So. Uh, I think this is where we should be getting into now, and I'd like to uh, begin with uh, Dr. Odame. What must we be doing immediately now to ensure that we are reducing the risk that managing waste as a result of, of the pandemic and during the pandemic um, does not you know, expose us a lot more to even further risk? What can we do, practical steps, that the state, the EPA, yourself, the Ghana Health Service, uh, perhaps the, I've heard you mention many times the local government, right? What yeah. should be done? Yeah, so I think, like it's a first is leadership. And like somebody said, uh, Singapore has said that we are in a time that is the, the, the world of the unknown unknowns. And I mean, this was said by one Singaporean Lim Siong. And I like that word because we are in a world that is now volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. We all don't know tomorrow how this coronavirus is going to turn out. So what is very clear is like what the president has kept on saying, that we are handling the coronavirus in the spirit of all on board, whole of government approach. So it gets, it gets back to your question. How is the Ministry of Environment ensuring that it's part of its mandate? It's playing it and playing into the hole. How is the local guy? I keep on saying the local guy because all the bylaws for enforcement are quietly enshrined in the local government. There's so much power now the district assemblies hold. To even enter in people's homes, to even go and inspect and whether there's mosquito larvae, collection of pool of water. It will amaze you the kind of bylaws we have that employ these institutions to go in there. And then the Ministry of Health, we on our side, the hospital side. Like I said, we've done the guidelines, we are doing the trainings. Now it's about the enforcement. And that's what we are doing in our facilities now. And trying to scale it up. I wouldn't say we've done it all. We are still in process of making sure we scale it up in the segregation. We are still providing these autoclaves to various facilities. Like in Cape Coast Teaching Hospital now, now they have one. Mm. Confinancy has a proper incinerator that can burn at those levels. Kofodia in East region also has an incinerator. What we've done is that we also alive to the fiscal space constraints. So we provided tricycles to some of this, we've well trained them to pick from the satellite uh, facilities, i.e. health centers, community health work, and then bring it up to the major facility where the combustion can go on. 
those who have the complete set, even have a second equipment that's used for shredding, that then reduces the waste before then Zoom Park picks it up and then it moves to the major side. So this one, but the major thing is all of us and the communities, you and me, Samson, mm. we also need to be vigilant and make sure that we don't throw things away anywhere, anyhow. Okay. And um, abide by the rules of the state. Mm. In that way, then we all help ourselves. I always say in coronavirus is two things. Either you're infected or you're affected. So if something you have it, I'm affected. If I have it, I'm infected. So anyhow you look at it, it's infected somewhere. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, set up practical steps that all the important stakeholders yeah. in and protection of our environment. And now it is a matter of urgent need to protect us because of the health implications. Yeah. What are you looking at from where you sit from Zoom Lion? Okay, so the first thing is, um, as, as Elia said, mm. the other regions do not have centralized infectious waste treatment facilities. So they are disadvantaged in this whole situation that we are talking of. So the first thing to do is to f immediately go into those regions. And this is possible through PPP. We, the private investors, we need to. We need some support from the government to actually do this. And also the enforcers should also do their job by bringing all the, especially healthcare facilities, on board to patronize the services. Because the challenge on the ground is the facilities complain of inadequate funds for waste. They'll tell you they have, they've not paid for their drugs, how much more waste. So there needs to be a support system that could actually help the private investor when he's going into such a thing, will be motivated, just like Mr. Franklin has, has, been, has been saying. Yeah. Mm. So this is where the next step that needs to be done, and it needs to be done, if today okay. it needs to be done, because it's very urgent. Otherwise, so you're talking about the state getting into PPPs yes. with the private organizations, organizations yes. to do what exactly and where? Yeah. To establish centralized medical waste or hazardous waste treatment facilities in each of the regions. How quickly can this be done? Actually, practically, within a month or two, such facilities can be established. Right. So far as the funds is made available immediately, mm. it can be established so that we can serve the whole region because we are all Ghanaians. We all need to benefit from this, not only get our courage. Right. Yes. OK. So uh, uh, Franklin Kujo, because of this pandemic, we need this as urgently as we can. What else do we need and to ensure that Cutting the waste from the point of collection to these places will be managed in such a way that the environment is not hurt and our health, you know, is not at risk. Well, at this juncture, I suspect that the, there's been a legion of uh, interventions and suggestions. Even what I said is not original with me. Mm. Uh, it just makes uh, sense that waste should be seen as a business. And until we wish as soon as a business, um, the challenges we're having would, would, would come to, would not, would, I mean, the challenges we're having will continue. I think uh, Dr. Dami makes a point about leadership. And I recall in one of my conversations with Dr. Nsiansari not too long ago, um, when I pointed out the study we conducted in 2016, May, uh, on, on the effect of biomedical waste, well, the way biomedical waste is handled in the country. He replied immediately and said, this is, of, this is so close to his heart and that it is more needed right now than ever and that anything that ought to be done, he would ensure that it's done. You see, that's clearly the shift there immediately. I suspect that uh, maybe this was not contemplated as part of the coronavirus, you know, tax force, uh, uh, what's it called? But again, there was... a. Uh, there was a, 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 an aha moment which Dr. Nsiasari realized, and I thought that that could have been a good starting point. I still believe it's a good starting point. So the combination of medical factors, a combination of uh, infrastructure issues, but at the end of the day, unless we to seen as a business, and the business of business is business, whereas all those partaking in the business are rewarded in one way or the other, None of this would go away. You mm. cannot have a situation where um, companies are, have to come up with almost 22% fees and levies 
and only and, and then only make a margin of almost 2.5 percent. As I said, that is not so anybody. That's not how anyone who wants to treat this uh, waste as a business okay. would would be with you. Mm. We should stop this endless cycle of every Saturday national sanitation cleaning cleaning. Those things are quite emotive and actually quite annoying. I think we should invest in large drains, covered drains as well. That's what this, the, private, the public sector should do. But the private sector can come in mm. and ensure safe disposal, and, 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 and that's the way to go, really. All right. Um, uh, thank you very much. Very, very interesting and practical solutions to assist in making sure that we have good environmental governance, particularly in the age of corona um, virus. Um, we, are, we are supposed to get some of your views and share them with everybody else if you have a question or one. Um, but let's bring in at this time the Mr. Samuel Asari Ekwamwa, who is the deputy chair, chairman in charge of operations of the NCCE. Uh, Mr. Kwama, uh, thank you very much for joining us. All right. Uh, so we will get back to uh, Josephine Nkrumah Rada uh, uh, because we don't have Mr. Samuel Asari Kwama uh, with us. So we'll get back to Josephine. And after having, you know, listening to all the uh, views that have been expressed and the practical solutions that have been given as the chairperson of the NCC that is leading uh, this uh, education uh, session for all of Ghanaians, what her remarks will be. Um, if you have anything to say in a minute, gentlemen, uh, I give you the opportunity to say so. Yes, so we'll start with Dr. Adam. Yeah, so I think I also want to end with a quote I said by the Singaporean, that we are in a world of the unknown unknowns. We all don't know tomorrow. As I sit here, I always say, coronavirus is no expert. Every single day we are learning something new. So this means we need a mindset to be very inquiring, to learn on our feet, and to make sure every day is a learning journey. And environmental governance becomes very key. In the SDGs, that's the uh, social contract for the world now, it's our people, it's mm. our planet, it's mm. our prosperity. Okay. We need to keep our planet safe for tomorrow. All right. And environmental governance is key. Okay. Thank you. And like you said from the start, that if you did the right thing at the wrong time, you have done it wrong. <laughs> and if you did the wrong thing at the right time, you may have done it wrong. But this is the time that you at the Ghana Health Service, as in government, will like to buy into the practical ideas that have been floated mm -hmm. so that the right thing is done mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Yes, Senam, in some 30 seconds. Yes, so... What I also say is that um, to, to overcome or to fight this corona, it's a cop um, we need to couple good leadership with personal responsibility. If these two are done well, we'll be able to win the battle and then we'll all be safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Franklin Kujo, um, President Imani Africa, um, you had very insightful you know, uh, contributions to make. Uh, do you have some 30 seconds to share any further points? Mm -hmm. Well, 30 seconds and spot on. See, look, as I said, I, I would still in the realms of business. This habit of government seeing big ticket transformative companies as a threat must stop. And I, I'm going to go all out there and vouch for Zoom Lion in spite of all the problems they may have. But Zoom Lion is a big, is a giant when it comes to waste management in the country. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, somebody says they are too big. And so even though they are doing noticeable interventions in trying to help us keep our environmental challenges, they need to be break, bro broken, broken into pieces. Okay. When you start breaking big ticket transformative companies into pieces, you end up with all the things you're having, all these kinds of uh, bobo years running around collecting waste here and there. Mm. You don't get any traction. So I think we should focus, as I said, the business of business is business. Mm. Policymakers, government, public public officers should be interested in building and and, and, and ensuring companies that flourish All right. in doing things. Thank I you. don't see why we shouldn't have waste. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Franklin Kujo.
and you have been watching and listening to the National Commission for Civic Education's National Dialogue. It's quarterly dialogue and um, today's has been on good environmental governance and the coronavirus pandemic. My guests have been uh, Senam uh, Tenge, who is uh, an engineer and manager, Medical Waste Department of Zoom Lion. Dr. Emmanuel Odame is Director of Policy Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, Ministry of Health. And of course, Franklin Kujo needs no introduction. He's the president of Imani Africa. Now, let's get back to um, Madame Nkrumah, who started the program with us. Madame Josephine Nkrumah is a chairperson of the NCCE. Uh, what will be your uh, final remarks? Samson, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, thank you. It's been an amazing discussion with our panelists, and indeed it has been insightful. It has opened our eyes to the other side of the pandemic and matters that we should take um, very seriously and matters that are urgent for us. For us, it tells us that there's a lot more we can do as ordinary citizens in Ghana in our homes. We must begin to adopt waste segregation for particularly our disposable masks and gloves that we use. Right. It's become even more imperative in the workplace to adopt such waste segregation practices, particularly because we're seeing a lot of workplace transmission. And this issue, these, these discussions have raised that critical issue that workplace um, human resource managers and administrators must begin to put in place measures that ensure that we segregate um, waste at the workplace. Right. I think the broader policy issues as, as well have been spoken about. Waste management, the kind of waste management architecture that we need to see in place. We need to ensure that we have a proper legal and regulatory framework in the informal sector, as we have noted, because there are certain places that it is clear that the big trucks like the Zoom Lions can go, but we need to find a way to get rubbish disposed of. All and right. for this reason, it's important for us to see that. Okay. Lastly, I think we must have in place the kind of policies um, that ensure that there are incentives that reduce tariffs and taxes on the implementation of, sorry, for the import, importation of waste management equipment, as we find in the agri sector. All right. These are the things that will mm. encourage the, the private sector to go into waste management and see it as the business to make business right. for business. As Thank said, you. Franklin Thank you. Says. Thank you so I very think. much. And Ms. Justin well, Nkrumah is a chairperson of the NCCE, and this has been the NCCE's uh, national di dialogue series. This is the first Arab national dialogue series uh, focusing on supplying you and 